Hi everyone, Jonathan Leipzig here, sadly in Vancouver. Not sadly, I like being in Vancouver, but I wish we were all together uh, joining for another amazing SCCT meeting. Uh, it's always the highlight of my years to join together with friends and colleagues from the society, uh, be it the summer meeting or so many amazing winter meetings over the years in, in the UK and, and beyond. But uh, I hope this uh, talk finds everyone in good health and let's hope we can get together in the not so distant future. I've been asked to talk about some of the issues with post-implant CT and really I'm going to share with you uh, some of my experiences from our core lab work in particular as it relates to this talk obviously Circle is uh, um, uh, sponsoring this uh, symposium and I want to uh, express my gratitude for them doing so and obviously highlight that sorry I do serve as a consultant to Circle and in addition the our learnings from the core lab work from which uh, we supported both the low risk Medtronic and Edwards uh, data, uh, uh, we use the circle software. So you'll see the images from it. So the first question of we're doing post implant tapper imaging, it's really important to understand what does hypoattenuating leaflet thickening, what is it and what does it look like on CT? So we've learned over the years, and this isn't impressed, this is my colleague Stephanie Sellers work, but really, when we think about the role of CT, CT is an anatomical test and it allows us to, uh, in a granular fashion, characterize the post-implant imaging of the device. In this case, we can characterize thrombus from circumferential panis, from calcification, all manifesting with very different CT-based imaging phenotypes. And this ability to discriminate these pathologies is essential to better refine our understanding of risk as well as treatment. So for years now, we've understood that HALT does occur. HALT is defined, as we'll see in a moment, as per the SCCT guidelines, is thickening of a leaflet, starting at the base, extending to the tip, always thickest at the base, uh, and then thinning out towards the tip. It occurs in all bioprostheses, not just transcatheter ones, but also surgical bioprosthetic valves. Now, the, the frequency may vary across the types of devices, but it's not a unique issue to TAVR. It is also seen, as we see in this case, in a number of the surgical valves from the Savory and Resolve registries led by the groups from Copenhagen and, uh, and uh, Los Angeles. As it relates to how to characterize HALT, I would ask that you reflect on the SCCT guidelines. Uh, in this case, what we really tried to highlight that, that HALT is not a binary diagnosis. It's not this patient has HALT, this patient doesn't have HALT. That's true, that's how we start our evaluation, but CT can offer us much more than that. Using a quality CT scan with good ECG synchronization, the patient has undergone TAVR, we can rate control the patient. What we could do is we can then characterize the extent of HALT. Does it involve just the base? Does it involve 50% uh, of the leaflet or so on? So really a score of one to four for each leaflet allowing an ordinal scale from zero to 12. 12 being overt valve thrombosis and zero being no halt. Uh, and this can be uniquely and consistently identified on the overwhelming majority of CT scans. So what do we recommend from the society perspective? What we would recommend is that we don't suggest that we should be doing CT routinely after TAVR just for the sake of uh, evaluating for HALT. On the other hand, we do recommend that if, if there's concern for HALT uh, or concern for valve failure, uh, we, should do, uh, um, we should give uh, a do CT to evaluate, um, to evaluate for HALT because CT can uniquely identify it and define whether or not the patient has uh, overt valve thrombosis. Uh, in addition, uh, we can evaluate then CT for leaflet thickening first and foremost, and secondarily for restricted leaflet motion. Leaflet motion should only be evaluated in the setting of HALT because CT is an anatomical tool. And first and foremost, it should be used to evaluate the presence or absence of hypoattenuating leaflet thickening. So how, the next question we would like, I would like to answer in this, in this talk is how common is HALT uh, in THV and SHVs? So for years now, we've seen that CT can uniquely identify HALT uh, and identify it more robustly than transthoracic echocardiography. In fact, the first case report was published by my friend and colleague, uh, uh, Philip Blanque and Gregor Pacha back in 2013, where they identified a patient who had five days post-implant, uh, had a post-implant CT with a rising gradient and had thickening there of the left coronary cusp. Building on that, we've seen work from the, uh, from the group from 
uh, from uh, Antonio Colombo and Azim Latip from five years ago, evaluating the frequency of overt valve thrombosis. Now, importantly, this is different than incidental halt. We're talking about overt valve thrombosis with significant rise in gradient. You can see this was very, this was an infrequent abnormality. 0.6% of patients had overt valve thrombosis. So clinically relevant valve thrombosis is rare, less than 1%. But if we look at how frequent incidental halt is, we really need to look at the subsequent publications. The first one I would highlight comes from Bjarne Norgard, who's a frequent uh, uh, presenter at the SCT meetings, a dear friend from Aarhus and Tina Liedma, showing five cases that were occult on transthoracic echocardiography that were identified on CT. Here you could see the classic features, not of infective endocarditis, but of HALT, thickened at the base, extending to the tips. Then recently we saw, actually it's not in press, this was published in Jack as well, uh, the, the incidence of HALT in the low risk uh, data, this is low risk Medtronic data, this is the low risk Edwards data. And what you can see is that the incidence of HALT was fairly similar between the surgical and uh, surgical and transcatheter aortic valves at both uh, 30 days and one year in the Medtronic case. And at, in the Edwards data, you could see that TAPR was more frequent or HALT was more frequent in THVs then SAP and then in SAVR at 30 days, but at one year, they normalized. And if you look at the literature, the rate of uh, HALT is roughly somewhere between seven and 40%, but most consistently around 15 to 20% at 30 days. Now, again, I would highlight to you that uh, HALT is not a binary diagnosis. HALT is actually a continuous variable. You can see different examples of it in a surgical valve, minimal HALT restricted to the base. On the other hand here, you could see a HALT score of probably nine or 10, where it's involving at least 50% of multiple leaflets. And here's a finding of overt valve thrombosis with severe leaflet thickening involving all three cusps. Now, when you do a post-implant CT, it really is important that you, you recognize that not everything you see that's hypoattenuating is in fact HALT. In order to call HALT, you want to see that it's thickened at the base and it extends to the tip and it thins at the tip. In this case, it's thinnest at the base and thickest at the tip. This, in fact, is not HALT, but this is a, a, a target lesion or a, a vegetation in the setting of a patient who was, uh, where there was clinical concern for infective endocarditis. And this is in keeping with the sequela of a vegetation of infective endocarditis. It is also important to understand that HALT isn't a perfect, uh, 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 isn't, uh, we're not perfect at the diagnosis of HALT. And you may say, well, what does that mean? Well, if you have a HALT score of 10, so you have overt valve thrombosis, I think everyone in the room or in the virtual room would be able to make that diagnosis and maybe there'd be some variation as far as the gradation goes. But when we looked at the, uh, a sub, uh, uh, the cases from the Galileo trial, which was published by George Dangus in the New England Journal, and, and we looked at the uh, post-implant CT, when we looked at between core lab reads, there was variation of, in agreement of those patients who had HALT less than 25% in a single leaflet. So there was a modest number of those cases, but when called by one lab, there was disagreement in up to 25% of cases. So if you're seeing very subtle thickening in just one leaflet, I don't think we should be so dogmatic to say that this patient has HALT. That finding a very minimal thickening of a single leaflet suggests to us that we could raise the possibility of it, but, but it's not a definitive diagnosis. On the other hand, if you have one leaflet with very extensive HALT or two leaflets with moderate HALT, these are more definitive diagnoses. As well, I think when we reflect on the in inadequate image quality challenges, seven to 20%, depending on the scanner technology and the protocol, it really highlights what we need to do as CT imagers to ensure that we, if we're gonna do these CTs, that they're good quality. The patients need rate control, consider a higher tube energy to avoid beam hardening, so 120 or 140, and good contrast injections. So the third question I'd like to try to address is, does HALT resolve on its own? Well, very interestingly, and this is data from Raj Makar, and it was uh, published in Jack, as mentioned, is that it was not infrequent. This is similar to what was shown by uh, Lars Sondergaard from, uh, from uh, Copenhagen and from the Savory Registry, is that there were a number of patients who, uh, in this case, had HALT at 30 days, but at one year, 56% of those patients had no HALT. Interestingly as well, there was a large number of patients, of course, that had no HALT at 30 days, but 21% of those patients developed HALT 
in the subsequent year. So what we may be talking about is a migratory phenomenon. For some patients, they may develop halt as part of a reaction to the implantation, and it may resolve without anticoagulation. And then other patients may have no halt and may develop halt over time. So very challenging diagnosis uh, and very challenging to understand what to make of these findings. And as I come to the discussion around really what to make of these findings, ultimately, as we would all agree, we don't image patients for imaging for the sake of imaging. We image them to help aid with making a diagnosis. And we want to make a diagnosis only because it affects prognosis and clinical outcomes. And to date, I'm not sure that HALT itself impacts downstream clinical outcomes. We have mixed data. These are data from, again, the, the CEDARS and the, and the uh, Copenhagen group showing that there may be a signal for increased stroke, or TIA at least, amongst those patients who had HALT as compared to those who did not have HALT. But there are inconsistent relationship between, or there is an inconsistent relationship between HALT and downstream outcomes. If we look at these data published in 2016 from the Aarhus group, there's no relationship, or there was no increased hazard of downstream complications for those with HALT as compared to those without HALT. And similarly, from the German group published in Jack Intervention, through just over a year, you could see here amongst those with uh, all-cause mortality with leaflet thickening or without the same outcome, and as it relates to stroke or TIA, a non-significant p-value with essentially the same outcome between no leaflet and with leaflet thickening. So really a lack of clarity as to whether HALT is even relevant uh, for the patient uh, as it relates to downstream risk of either stroke, TIA, or mortality. But I think what we really need to do as a society and as a field is try to understand whether or not HALT may in fact be an inciting event for structural valve degeneration. We've learned from the Quebec uh, group uh, over the years that there are a number of patients who experience early valve degeneration post-TAVR, roughly uh, uh, you know, somewhere between about 5% will have valve degeneration at one year. And they provided predictors such as absence of anticoagulation, interestingly, valve and valve, small transcatheter heart valve, and so on. And we've seen refinement of what defines structural valve degeneration and bioprosthetic valve failure uh, by a number of groups, including uh, a former colleague of ours here in Vancouver, Danny DeVere, who's back in, uh, in Israel and Jerusalem, and he provided a, an echo-based staging criteria along with many others. Similarly, the European Society came with guidance, really highlighting that we shouldn't be relying on uh, um, uh, you know, the historical definition for surgical valve failure was fail, uh, absence of reintervention. So if you didn't reoperate on a patient, they didn't have valve fa failure. But that's, of course, naive. We know there are many patients who were too high risk for repeat surgery who were told who were not included as having valve failure, who clearly did. So what we're now looking at is really better understanding our, 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 our definitions, looking at structural valve degeneration by way of leaflet thickening, but also hemodynamic effect of stenosis, regurgitation, and so on. And really defining how to approach these patients in a much more thoughtful and careful way. So with this more careful lens, the real question is, can CT help us under, understand some of these potential predictors? And in order to understand some of these CT predictors, I would suggest to you that we should actually learn from some of the pathology that we have from some of these cases. And my colleague, Stephanie Sellers, has looked at explanted transcatheter heart valves. And what she's shown us, and it's just hypothesis generating, but it's quite, quite interesting and intriguing to imagine that, in fact, thrombus may be an inciting vent for valve degeneration. And the reason I say that is if you look at explanted valves, we never saw a patient who had a structural valve, who had a valve explanted with calcification in the absence of fibrosis. And we never saw fibrosis in the absence of thrombus. So thrombus seems to be the first building block of what's needed to progress to fibrosis and calcification. Now the missing link and the question we can't answer is what percentage of patients with thrombus actually go on to fibrosis and actually go on to calcification. But I think our data suggests uh, at least raises the possibility that you cannot develop calcification without thrombus. I think we'll learn over the coming year from the continued great work from people like Mark Dweck and David Newby and, and uh, Alistair Moss and Michelle Williams uh, looking at sodium fluoride PET. 
And I'll, I'll close with these cases because I think it really highlights what we need to continue to do as a field of imagers working with our clinical colleagues. What you could see here is similar to what they've shown in native uh, aortic stenosis, is that patients with sodium fluoride avidity were more likely to have structural valve degeneration of both this, of the surgical valves. And now they're looking at transcatheter valves. So perhaps they're patients with HALT that could have this sodium fluoride avidity representing valve degeneration, microcalcification, and a marker of a patient who is now on their way to having valve degeneration versus some patients who have HALT that don't have sodium fluoride avidity, who may have more of a benign pattern. And this may help us better understand which patients with HALT go on to valve degeneration and which ones don't. We can learn even beyond the aortic valve about some of the differences in pathology as it relates to tricuspid valves. So this is just looking at explanted tricuspid and pulmonic valves, right-sided valves, highlighting that the patterns of valve degeneration are quite different. They don't have the, the microcalcification. They don't have the same kinds of, uh, uh, of lipid deposition that we see in left-sided valves, but rather we see uh, elastosis and, uh, and different patterns of valve degeneration on the right side of valves. Again, far be it for me to be sharing this, I'm not a pathologist, but I think this is really highlighting to me that we need to continue to work in a multidisciplinary fashion with our pathologists, with our metabolic imagers that are doing uh, uh, sodium fluoride work, with our functional imagers that are doing echo, and come together with our anatomical findings from CT to better understand these imaging signatures and how it relates to patients. And finally, I think there's a lot of work as it relates to, pardon the overlap of the uh, title here, but there's a lot of work as it relates to things like computational fluid dynamics and, and, um, and uh, advanced analytics to better understand this concept of altered neosinus washout endothelial damage, neosinus stasis, to really understand whether or not, uh, to what extent the mechanical forces and the sluggish flow in the neosinus uh, may be driving, for example, valve degeneration or leaflet thrombosis versus the biological elements that I just highlighted to you related to perhaps uh, 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 endothelial dysfunction and a native uh, uh, and an inflammatory reaction to the native uh, aortic valve uh, being crushed to the side during TAVR. So all of these complex interplays between imaging, uh, metabolic imaging, and then of course computational modeling to understand mechanical forces and potential drivers of HALT. I will close there, but I'm really grateful for the opportunity. I think there's so much more we need to learn. I think advanced imaging tools uh, from all of the vendors are really going to be essential for us to evaluate our CT data sets, to understand uh, and make confident diagnoses of things like HALT. But I think we as a field of cardiac CT imagers need to not only make the diagnosis, but we need to work with our colleagues across disciplines to help understand how our imaging findings can fit into the evaluation of these patients and can help us better understand things such as risk of mortality, stroke, but also valve degeneration, and then work together with others to refine our treatment strategies to help optimize clinical outcomes. I thank you so much for your attention, and I'm really grateful for uh, the opportunity to have shared with you today.